Wow, Palm Sunday. I, uh, somebody asked me, I said, you just going to preach on the letters from the, the, the book of Revelation on Palm Sunday? Yes, I am. I'll let you know. Why this message on Palm Sunday? Why not? Um, believe it or not, the church that we deal with today has a problem with not completing what they start. It's interesting because on Palm Sunday, it was the day that Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem, or right before that, and he entered into the city to bring himself to a place where he would be executed on a cross. He was completing what his father had set him to do and what he agreed to do for you and me. So how fitting would it be that we read about a church that doesn't complete what it should complete. <coughs> That's not the totality of the message, but I hope that you'll catch that as I began to tell you a little bit more about Sardis. It is one of my points in the message, but what a wonderful point it is. What are the things in your life that you haven't completed? Just think about it. When we come to that point, I hope you'll kind of put some of those things in there and see how they fit into the things of God. The city of Sardis is a very interesting place. It was one of those things, kind of like the anomaly of churches today. How many times have you been to a church and they talk about all the things they've done in the past? Especially older churches. They remember the heyday of what they used to do. Believe it or not, Sardis had, the city itself, had that kind of history. It was based upon the idea or the, the fact that it was on a mountain, the Mollus, and on three sides of that mountain, it was 1,500 feet high, and on three sides of it, it was guarded by almost sheer cliffs. On the south side of the city, you could uh, get into it from the south side, but uh, they had that very much fortified, but most of the time, they didn't have to worry about it because it had these walls around it. You had to basically be a climber to be able to get into the city of Sardis if you tried to attack them any other direction other than from the south. It had been the capital of the kingdom of Lydia. I mean, it's got some rich heritage into it. And the process of it, once it was the kingdom of Lydia, and this was its capital city, then Cyrus the Great came and conquered the city, much the way I told you they had their soldiers climb up the walls. Can you imagine that? But the city was unprepared. They thought that because of the walls, nobody would be foolish enough to climb, so they didn't pay any attention to the walls, and therefore the enemy came up and took the city quite easily. In fact, it happened a couple of times in history. But if you remember Cyrus, Cyrus the Great, the Persian king, remember when we were talking about Isaiah, and Isaiah prophesied 150 years before Daniel even came on the scene and said, Cyrus is going to do these things, and Cyrus is going to have Jerusalem rebuilt, and then when Daniel shows those things to Cyrus, Cyrus is like, Wow. And everything that God set Cyrus up to do, he did. Well, this is the same Cyrus, the one that conquers this city. Later, it would become uh, the kingdom of the Seleucids, uh, their empire as well. And then, of course, Rome came in. But by then, they had accomplished great things. The city had done wonderful things, but by the time Rome came in, it was a just a city. It wasn't anything of great value. It had been conquered, and therefore the three-sided uh, citadel that they had was, was penetrable, so it wasn't something that everybody just said, hey, we want to keep. And in fact, they built uh, on either side, they built small little communities, parts of the city as well, and it became rather large. However, it still never gained what it once was. It's interesting because as I look at churches, uh, uh, a missionary one time told me that he was in Germany and he went and visited one of the, the uh, uh, concentration camps outside of this particular city and, and he set up on a hill. And he looked out over the city and he could see the city from there and he saw all the steeples from the churches. And as he saw those steeples, he said, you know, this must have been just horrendous for the people who were killed in this camp and for those who knew what happened here, for them to look out over the city and see those steeples. So he went down to see what those churches were at the present time of his visit. 
They were coffee shops. They were businesses. But none of them were churches. It's interesting because as we look at this church at Sardis, we see that they're doing some things, but not much. We see that uh, it's time of, yay, look at us, was gone. Those churches in Germany, I'm sure, had a very rich heritage and a history to them, just knowing about Martin Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and some of those that it just had to have some rich heritage, but now they sit just empty edifices with nothing of oh God. Wow, when I, when I think about this, I'm, I'm thinking about the churches that I hear of in our day today, that there's not enough people to come to take care of the responsibility of care for the building or for that which God has given them, and they have to close their doors. It's a sad, sad day. And if you remember several weeks ago when I started this, a lot of people want to run automatically to the church of Laodicea, and that's us. That's us today. I believe not. I know that we're headed toward that, but I really believe that you can find the church of today in Pergamum, by Tyre, and Sardis. I can see those things. Well, when Rome came in and took it over, the peace of Rome, just basically the city declined. And in 17 AD, there was an earthquake that devastated the city. Tiberius, who was the Caesar when Jesus was killed, he gave $10 million in the currency of the day to have the city rebuilt. So as we come to this and we, we understand a little bit about the city, it's a city that had great prominence but then it's dwindled down to pretty much something that the government has to take care of because it can't take care of itself. Isn't that kind of what the church looks like sometimes when you look at it today? They say by 2020 that the church will just almost be obsolete. And you may be saying, but I see big churches and everything like that. More and more people are not willing to make the commitment to be a part of a church, a local body like this. And they just say, I'm a part of the big body of God, and that's all that I need. Well, that's probably why we're not reaching people with the message of Jesus Christ. Because when you try and do it out there all by yourself, sometimes it's tough. But when you have a body of believers around you who is encouraging you and sharing with you the great victories that God has given and the things that God is doing all around you, it's a whole lot easier, isn't it? We always like a little bit of encouragement, don't we? Several weeks ago, I ran in a race. I lost. <laughs> Both of them, they gave me a ribbon for second place. I was thrilled. Not really. But I got a ribbon for losing. Yay! I got to tell you, there was a cloud of people around me, though, who said, way to go, Pastor. Good job. I lost. <laughs> but I got to tell you, it made me feel an awful lot better. Because it was like, hey, you tried. You lost, but you tried. Well, when we come to read about this church, pay very close attention to some of the things that we've spoken about here and also what we're about to read about in Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which are about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few good people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, we come before you and I pray that in the presentation of this message, in the culmination of the study this week, and the things, Father, you've laid on my heart, and Father, that you've spoken to me about from your word, I pray that I'd be able to communicate them in the way that you would have me to. I pray, Father, that you'd correct in the hearing of those anything that is opposite of what you would have them hear. And I pray that your spirit would just be in this place today. Help us to learn. Help us to listen. Help us to apply these truths to our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. As always, I speak about the first things that we find in this. This church is showing that it looks like it's alive, but it's really dead. John MacArthur, in preaching on this passage and his commentary, I think, has a very good picture of this. Did you know that stars that are 40,000 light years away from us, if they were to go out within your lifetime, you would never know it because they would shine until your death. Because that darkness from that star, although you see it today, is coming from a dead star and it's just waiting for the light to get there. I think that's a really good illustration of what we have in this. However, though, he says, you're dead. You need to come back to life. You know, if, if I could illustrate this, sometimes I sleep the wrong way, and maybe you do too, and a particular part of your body, like a hand or an arm or a leg, goes to sleep, and it's like, man, what are you doing? And you wake up, and it's like, stop that. Have you ever been there? Okay. What would it be like to remain like that? You'd probably go to the doctor, and if it got worse, you'd probably say, let's whack that thing off. <laughs> You're hoping it wakes up, don't you? Wake up. But sometimes we call that, you know, my arm is dead. Well, we can see that kind of a picture in this. He says, wake up. You have to remember that God is for the church. That Jesus Christ, as he's speaking to the church, he's for us. He's pro-church. That's why he said the gates of hell is not supposed to prevail against it. That's why he gave the, the picture of husbands love your wives as Christ loved the people, the church, which consists of his people. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Yes, he died for every one of us individually, but he died for the church collectively. That's his bride, as we spoke about last week. And that's why it's important that we ask ourselves the question, do we look like a bride? Are we acting like a bride? Well, when he comes and he speaks to him, he says, the one who has the seven spirits and the seven stars, the seven stars, the messengers, the seven spirits is very interesting. He identifies it in chapter 1, verse 4. If you want to look over there really quick, it says in verse 4 of chapter 1 of Revelation, John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Hmm. Okay. And then he goes on to say in that same passage, and from Jesus Christ. I, I want to point out to you that the seven spirits that are spoken about here are not only in Christ, but there are things that you can come to understand. I'm not preaching that you can be a God. These are some things that we can get a clearer picture of over in Isaiah, but we're not going to go there yet. Because this is mentioned again in Revelation in chapter 4, and it's in the throne room, and it's speaking about these seven spirits before the throne of God, again apart from Jesus. But we find in chapter 5, we find it identifying Jesus because of chapter 5, verse 6. I'll give you a minute to turn over there so you don't think I'm just being heretical. <laughs> chapter 5, verse 6. Chapter 5, verse 6 says, And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures, and the elders, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Now you can read the rest of that and you'll see that Jesus is appearing in chapter 5 to be able to open the book. But notice we have those seven spirits. It's an identification that this is Jesus that's speaking to them. And what are the seven spirits? Well, I'm going to ask you now to turn over to Isaiah chapter 11. 
because this is the passage that speaks about that a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, which is Jesus. And given to him are seven things. And I would suggest to you, this is why we need to see them apart from Christ, both in Christ, in the Father, before the Father, in the angels, and in us today. It's not that I'm saying we can attain to be God. I'm saying these seven spirits are things that we ought to be attaining ourselves or moving toward in our life and understanding of these things. Because in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 5, Then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his root will bear fruit. Who is that? All right, I'm not sure you know who that is. Let's try that again. Who is that? Thank you. Verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord, number 1, the Spirit of the Lord, that's first, will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom, understanding, the Spirit of counsel, and strength, and knowledge, and fear of the Lord. So, so, I'm sitting there. That makes sense to me. I'm not trying to sell you on the idea. That makes sense to me. That these are the things that we'll see in the Son of God. And did we see all of those things in Him? Came straight from the throne of God. But of course, so did Jesus Christ from the throne of God. But let me ask you a question. Can you understand everything there is about God? No. No, but can you have understanding about God? Yes. Can the Spirit of the Lord rest in you? I hope so. The spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, strength, knowledge, and a fear of the Lord. Seven things that identify us, and guess what? While we're practicing and learning about those things from God's Word, He grows us and we know more and more and more. But all of it is because Christ brought all of these things, not that they weren't here before, but He brings them and He shows them and He's telling the church at Sardis, I am all of these things. I am Him. I am the one that has been given these things from the throne of God. And yet there are things that are attainable in your life as well. Because they can be apart from Jesus Christ. And you may say, wait a minute, Brother Jack, you get kind of red here just a minute. Stick with me for just a minute. These are things that in Christ, as you know him, that you can exercise in as well. And the Spirit of God doing what he wants you to do and understanding and counsel and fear and all of those things. Do we not get those things from God's Word? And who brings them to us? The Holy Spirit. And it's identifying Jesus Christ as the one who has these things. And it says, this is why he says, the seven stars and the seven spirits, I have the things from the throne of God that you need. I have those things. And it's me that's speaking. So once again, as identified in chapter 1, we see that it's Jesus Christ. And if I could suggest to you today that it is the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, strength, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. Those are great things to come from the throne. And we see that in the throne room, and we see it identified with Jesus in the seven eyes, the seven horns, and the things that are pictured later in Revelation. Well, as you think about those things, understand that it's Jesus Christ who has a right to speak on all of these things. If you'll remember, in these last weeks at Ephesus, they were seeking, he was desiring them, they were seeking purity, and he was desiring them to return to the first love. We see at Smyrna that it was a suffering church. We see at Pergamum that it was the synagogue of Satan, and Thyatira, it was Satan's throne. And then we see in, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, I missed one in there. Uh, let me get back. Uh, yeah, Ephesus, the suffering church. Then we had uh, Pergamum, synagogue of Satan, uh, Satan's throne, and then the teachings, uh, which we dealt with last week. I'm trying to the right church. Yep, I'm back. Okay. Back to our. And then we come to Sardis. And in Sardis, we find a very interesting thing that takes place. We see that there is no persecution in Sardis. You know how we've talked about it, how the Romans were doing this, and how the Jews that were apostates and everything like that, they were doing this and they were doing that. Did you notice there is no persecution in Sardis? 
There's nothing that says, hey, I, I know that there's evil people there and they're trying to ruin the church and there's no persecution. It reminds me of us today because we sit and we think, oh, we're persecuted because someone asks us about sexual orientation or transgender or homosexuality and all of a sudden because we have a, enter into an argument like that, we go, oh my goodness, I'm being so persecuted. You have no idea what persecution meant. And in this world, what they had done is they had compromised themselves to what the pagan world was teaching. And it wasn't that there was any one thing that was said, hey, stop doing this. It was that you had just succumbed to the things of this world. You had said that the pagan ideologies, I can accept those. If you remember, Thyatira was a trade city. It, it was a city of commerce. And, and whatever guild you were in, you had to kind of go along with whatever they believed. But here in Sardis, there's none of that. There's no Jews like there were in Smyrna. There were no Jews who were apostates who were basically just trying to accomplish what they thought rather than the things of God by turning Christians over to the Romans because they wouldn't practice them for worship. But we don't see that in this city. This is why I say this looks more like the church today, at least in America, than I see I see this as a church that is, they just kind of schmoozed along. You know, it, it would be a church that parents would try and justify their kids' actions instead of calling it sin. Or church leaders who would, oh, well, you're an important person in the church, and we're just going to let that one slide. It would be those compromises that we see in churches today. Don't worry about that. Because we form relationships with other people that require us to embrace them rather than a relationship with the Lord that depends on Him. I've had people who have come and at one time in their life, that's just as wrong as it can be. But the first time that their children get involved in something like that, it's not about forgiveness and grace. It's about justifying their children's sin. And that's wrong. I don't care how you, how you wrap it up and you say it's all about God's love. Listen to me. God's love doesn't condone sin. It never has. God's love gives grace to those who repent. So when we look at this, they don't have, there's no trouble here. They just kind of merged right in to, and if you're saying, oh man, those people of Sardis, I got to tell you, before you start looking at them too harshly, I believe in our world today, we've merged into the ideology of the world more than we have the things of God. You see why I would say this is relevant to us today? I don't want to just take it and lay it in and say, tell you how bad you are. I want you to see that this is, and notice the progression here. There's been persecution, persecution, persecution. There is none here. Because of that, we kind of lose our vision. They appeared to be alive, but they were dead. In Matthew chapter 21, verse 19, Jesus comes upon a tree, and it's beautiful. It has all its leaves where they're supposed to be, but it's supposed to be bearing fruit. And he walks up to the tree and he, he, he looks and there's no fruit on it and he curses the tree right there and it dies. You see, the church is supposed to be doing something. Not just looking alive, it's supposed to be making an impact in the world where it is. Whether it's in Sardis or Thyatira or whether it's in San Antonio, Texas, the church should be making a difference where they are and it ought to look like the things of God. Well, they had no relevance. They were in the world, and to the world, they were okay. But they had no relevance. How many of you like to watch the, the television program MASH? Most of you know MASH. It's interesting because how they represent what's right and the things that we would say are of God or the guy that was always running around trying to get everybody to do what seemingly was right by the rules. <coughs> Who was it? Frank Burns. Frank Burns. <laughs> That's right. It wasn't Father Mulcahy. It was Frank Burns. And he was always about
about the righteousness, but he was having an adulterous affair with one of the ladies in the camp major Hulan. And then when they pressed him on why it should be that way, he had no answer. He, he, the writer of MASH, whether knowingly or not knowingly, took Christianity and kind of put it in the envelope of Frank Burns and made Christianity look like a stupid buffoon who just practices and dabbles in sin. But if you think about it, there's a lot of shows out there that take Christianity and put it in the form of some stupid, heretical, hypocritical character. So that when people see that, they go, that's what all Christians are. It's interesting because the only relevance they want us to have is when they think they need us. But any other time, they want to be able to dismiss us. And if we're dead, but we just look alive, it's very easy to do that. Even in a sitcom. Well, he gives them five imperatives. And if you'll look with me in chapter 3, he gives them five imperatives. The first one that he says is, wake up. Wake up. It's interesting because... In some translations, it may say, uh, it may say wake up and, uh, or, or be watchful. Now, it's interesting that he would put that together. And for us today, we would say, no, wake up sounds right. But it could have been watchful. Be watchful. Here's why. Remember I told you that the city had been attacked in places they didn't think they needed to watch? So it would make sense. In some translations, it's be watchful. And yours, it may say, wake up, but be watchful, wake up. Pay attention to what's going on. You can't leave those walls in your life undone. You can't just say, because I go to church, everything in my life is okay. Because I, I, I read my Bible or I, I uh, talk with people or whatever, everything is okay. Those are areas that need to be guarded all the time because the enemy can climb those walls anytime he wants to. He can create all kinds of stumbling blocks for you. The enemy has no problem with that. So to the people, it had kind of a double meaning. To us, it's only one. Wake up. Be the watchman on the wall. Pay attention to what's going on. But to that city, it was peculiar in particular to them because that's how they had been conquered. By people climbing up where they didn't think they would be. I could almost spend the rest of the day giving you pictures of that in our lives today. The areas that we don't guard thinking we're okay there. The areas that we don't spend time with God about. The areas that are hidden maybe to God because they're our own things. It could be our possessions. <coughs> I've got enough I don't have to worry about. I, it could be our bank accounts. It could be our, our family and our, our legacy, our children. It could be all sorts of things. I don't have to worry about those. Let me ask you a question, moms and dads. Do you pray for your kids every day? Not because they're in trouble or they're having problems, but because you pray for them every day because that's a godly thing to do for your kids. Those are the areas you've got to look out for. Those are the areas where Satan will attack. Not just in our kids, in our finances. Some people put so much money into the stock market, and then when it crashes, for Christians, like, oh my goodness, I lost so much. Wait a minute. Are you doing it God's way, the way he wants you to do it? Are you storing up treasures in this world, or are you storing up treasures in heaven? What are you doing? You see, those are the areas, and, and, and there's so many more. You, I hope you're thinking of some of those areas in your life that you need to say, wait a minute, I need to make more prayer. I need to say and talk to God more about those aspects of my life, those places in my life that are empty, <coughs> undone, or those places that I thought were secure. But I realize that Satan wants to attack at any time. And, you know, some people would say, well, you have to live a life of paranoia. You know, you don't. You live a life of joy. Because our Lord will reveal those to you and he'll equip you to take care of those areas in your life. But if you're not paying attention to them and you don't care, it's like the church and the city of Sardis. The enemy can sneak in so I talked about moms and dads who have older kids. Let me ask you a question. You, you moms and dads that have younger kids, are you praying for who your child is going to marry when they grow up? You don't even know them by name yet. 
You don't know who they are. Are you praying for them? Are you praying that your child will seek the Lord and follow his path? Sometimes, oh yeah, Brother Jack, I'm doing that. Really? Is that a part of your prayer each day? I'm not saying this is a this is a, a rope thing that you do just because Brother Jack said so, like a, a blessing and a meal. Jesus, thanks for our food, forgive us our sins, amen. I'm not talking about that. Do you pray earnestly before God about your children, about your work, about your boss, about your wife, about your husband? Do you come before him in the places where Satan would just love to attack? Do you come before him and say, Lord, I don't want any attacks in these areas of my life. Prepare me. Prepare them. You pray for those things. Look out for the places. Be watchful. Wake up. Look at the places Satan could attack. Ask God to reveal those things that you can be praying and before God about them. And you know what? I have found that even when Satan attacks, if God has told us that he's coming, God will see us through it. The question is, God's prepared. Are you? Most of the time, we're, oh, my goodness, my goodness, something terrible has happened in my life. There's been this tragedy or this event or this or that. And, and, and God says, I got that covered. And I got you in my hand. We're so concerned about the, the provision that we forget his presence in our lives. It's time to wake up. Pay attention. Be watchful. So we see the first imperative. The second thing, he says, establish the things that remain. In other words, go back and see what's important. I'm reading a book right now called The On-Purpose Person. And it basically says what you need to do is you need to go through life and think about all the things that you want. And as you go through this book and come to the end of it, it basically helps you to know what's important. And then to act upon what's important. And to do what's important. The whole premise of this is, hey, watch. Establish the things that remain. What is important to you? What are your priorities in this church? Individual, what is your priority toward God? Why are you here today? To feel good about yourself? Because mommy and daddy told you to? Because you've got some catastrophe in your life? Because you want to hear Brother Jack preach? <laughs> Why are you here today? Why do you do the things that you do during the week? What are your priorities in life? He's questioning at these levels because I have found that things that hold a low priority usually don't get accomplished, at least in my life. How about you? No amen. I'm the only one who lives in that world. It has low priority. Well, he tells them, he says, figure out those things that are important. And it's very interesting because he addresses them and with the seven spirits of knowledge and understanding and wisdom. And isn't that cool how that all just kind of fits all together? What are your priorities in life? What's important to you? Notice that he says in that verse, he says, you didn't finish your work. My heart is heavy, and I'm only going to say this just very briefly. My heart is very heavy. And, and some people don't get this, and they think, Brother Jack's trying to build some kind of monument. I'm not bringing the building up to bring the building up. But i got to tell you, this last week was a very hard time for this pastor. Satan seemed to attack from every angle that he could. Some of the very things I'm sharing with you right now is because I've lived some of those this week. Not only in my life, but just this last week has been really tough. And one of the issues that's heavy on my heart is the building. Let me tell you why. When I came here, they told me that God intended this property to have buildings on it to the glory of God for the purpose of ministering to this community. Amen. That's what I was told when I came here. I saw the plans of this church all the way back from 1982. In 1986 when they built in 1980, why do I know all these things? Because I'm sitting here saying, Lord, you started to work in this church. And this church has fallen by the wayside because of this emergency or that emergency or this or that. And while your providence is, is clear through all of this, and while, as we can see these things happening, it was the heart of the people that wasn't right. Amen. It was the people that weren't saying God's plan in this. And then as I was sitting there Monday night just kind of feeling sorry for myself about issues and the building, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? I'd ask that all day long, but you know what? I was obstinate toward the Lord because I was saying, what do you want me to do? And I wasn't going to his word to find out. I just kind of have a little, I'm going to hold my nose. 
and I breathe. I'll be honest with you, I'll tell the whole story because it's kind of humorous. And uh, My wife went to bed. It was, I don't know, 1130 at night. So instead of me opening up the Bible and saying, Lord, show me, or just starting my study or anything, I went and got shirts out of my closet, and I stayed in there until 2 in the morning ironing shirts. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't do it for anybody else. I mean, starching them and just iron them shirts. And then on top of all, I kept having this nagging voice in the back of my head, just read the sermon for Sunday. Just read the passage. And I was like, Lord, I'm going to iron one more shirt. So I went and got one more out of my closet. <laughs> 2.15. I couldn't sleep. So I said, okay, Lord. So I sat down and I just read this passage and it talked about the work that God had started and they didn't complete. <laughs> now I know why God was telling me, read that. Folks, i got to tell you something. Whether the building's built or not, it doesn't reflect on whether this pastor is faithful or not. I'm going to be faithful to the fact that God said, I gave you five acres. What are you doing with it? you got a better idea to be able to do with it? I'm all game. But here's the thing. I don't know how it's going to get done. I don't know all those things. I'd like to say we've got it all figured out and everything like that, but I know our God knows. Amen. And as I've seen through Scripture, and so I'm sitting there going, I'm not responsible for all the things that have to happen to make it happen. I'm responsibly faithful to walk with God through it. Amen. And you know what? If that scares some of you, I was scared too. And it's okay. Because once I saw that and it was very clear, I don't want to be the church at Sardis. I don't want to be the church that starts the things of God or God starts things in the church and the church just goes, I don't want to be there. That's why I'm saying this deals with churches today. That's why he says those things you know, those things that you know, the established things, pay attention to them. This was a dream that God put in this church back almost 30 years ago. And all I'm saying as pastors, we need to be about what God called us to do and not turn to the right or the left or let those things scare us or dissuade us from doing what God's called us to do. Like I said, if you've got something else, you've had a divine thing while you're standing in front of the mirror shaving or putting on your makeup and God's face appeared and told you, I'd really like to talk with you before the service is over with. <laughs> At the door, preferably. <laughs> well, they didn't finish their work. It fell short. And why did it fall short? Because they lacked motivation and most import importantly, spiritual orientation. They spiritually weren't where they needed to be. It's hard to accomplish anything for the Lord when, first of all, our spiritual orientation isn't where it needs to be. What's important to us? You see the priority of this? Their motivation couldn't be what it needed to be because of the spiritual orientation. You can say all day long, we're highly motivated to do that. But i got to tell you, spiritually you're not prepared for this. This is going to be a rocky road for you. And I'm saying, this is a good time to go find another church. <laughs> i got to tell you something, you'll be the only one that loses in that deal. Because if God's got you here, he's got a purpose and a plan for you. And the best thing to do is say, Lord, what would you have me? But it's a spiritual orientation that says, Lord, I'm going to do what you call me to do. It may hurt. It may require me to change some of my plans. But, Lord, I'm going to do it because you're God. Well, the third thing that we see in this, he says, remember what you have received. And that's past tense. And then he goes on and gets here. But in the, in the, the, the Greek, when you look at that, this is an instructive passage to them. He said, you received the faith. I told you about the faith. You knew about it, probably from Paul, from John, maybe even Timothy, maybe Aquila or Priscilla, whatever the case may be. You heard it. And now I'm, I'm instructing you and telling you to pay attention. You know these things, the things that I'm speaking about right now. You're saying, well, that brother Jack's kind of off over the wall on this. I've never heard these things before. You know you've heard these things. You know, I, I kind of feel like Paul standing in front of Agrippa. You know this to be true. Why? 
Because the same Spirit, if you're in Christ Jesus, lives in you, lives in me. Amen. And because of that, for you to deny it, you denying the Spirit. And I would encourage you, that's not a very healthy place to be. He says, remember these things and listen to my instruction about it. You did hear. You're in, I'm telling you that this is going to happen. And then he comes and he tells them, he says, remember what you have received and did here." And then the, the fourth imperative that we see is he said, keep it. Keep it. You know, sometimes when a preacher gets up and he gives you a really energetic spirit of, of, of sermon, and you go, wow, that was a great sermon. You go for about a week and then you just burn out about Wednesday. You forget everything that you heard and all the things you said you were going to do and you kind of go, you, you've had that before. Yeah. But keep it. You see, when you're energized because I'm excited about something, that doesn't mean you're excited. It just means I got some of what I got on you. You need to keep what God puts in you on you. You need to let that be. And when, when I say something that deals with God's word and his working, you ought to be like, hey man, I understand that because I agree. Why? Because the same spirit. That's why over in Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about the tongues and it talks about the whole thing. But it keeps saying, it's the same spirit within us. The question is, same spirit. In Christ Jesus it is. Well, they weren't willing to keep it and he instructs them to keep it. He tells them to re repent and he tells them that judgment is coming. He says, if you don't repent, what was the message at Nineveh? Repent or now, Jonah didn't like that so much. But when the people heard it in Nineveh, what did they do? They were embedded. And Jonah was kind of a little miffed about that. He wanted to see like fireworks. But God's plan, and, and notice here for his church, he says, can it be turned around? Yes, it can. Can it come back to life? Yes, it can. But it depends upon the people, the church. Seeing and doing the things of God. Stop doing what you're doing. Where the only thing that I can see here, what are they repenting of? They're repenting of their attitude that says, oh, let's just be as ecumenical as we can. Let's not argue about anything. Let's not speak the truth about anything. Whatever anybody says, we just accept it and whatever. I tried that on my wife this morning, that whatever thing. <laughs> Doesn't work well. But you see, God didn't call us to tell the world whatever. He called us to be a light in the world. He called us to be His people in the world. So He tells them to, to repent, wake up. They're in a perilous position. They become secularized. But He says to those in verse 4 who had chosen not to let their garments be soiled. Why is that important? Because to present yourself with soiled garments in worship would be to... Disgrace God. Say you're not worthy. This is why when we're talking about the bride, what does it look like to be the bride of Christ? Do we look like the bride of Christ? Have we compromised ourselves so much? Have we become so secularized? Is it that now we can watch programs and we can see things that we just kind of, oh, well, it's just the world we live in. Well, the world we're living again is the world we're supposed to be making a difference in. Why would I just agree and endorse the things of sinful behavior? Some of you might say, well, I, I do this or I do that, and every once in a while I'll say something this way or I'll just not say anything. Wait a minute. That's no different than the rest of the world. The rest of the world just says, hey, let's just live and let live. Here's the other problem with that. That live and let live means that there's going to be some that go to hell. That's sad. I don't want to live and just let live because it means there's people out there who will never hear about Jesus Christ because I wasn't Christian enough, I wasn't so in love with the Lord that I kept my mouth shut and never said a word to them about it and then they spend eternity in hell because I thought it was not the right thing to do because the world would be upset. I gotta tell you, I fear the one who wields the sword of eternity in my flesh, my spirit, and all of it, which is God, above the things this world. Well, he promised those, though, that didn't allow themselves to be secularized and not dishonor God in worship. He said, you know what? You're going to walk in white. I'm closing with this thought because this is awesome. 
He says you're going to walk in white. There's other references to this, and you can. It doesn't say walk in white in Revelation 14, but if you look at Revelation 14, it talks about in the first few verses that the 144,000 that follows Christ everywhere does what He wants them to do. Then in chapter 17, it speaks about those clothed in white, those that had followed Him no matter what took place. And because of that, they were clothed in white. It was a way of saying that I see what you're doing and I understand that you're being faithful to me about all of these things. Walking in white signified or could signify a way of describing those who were justified. Those that had done what Christ had said. You may be saying, oh, wait a minute, I'll never walk in, in a robe of white. You know what? It'd be great if there's 1 John 1, 9. Because the blood of Christ covers us. And where Satan would say, you can't because you've done this, when our heart is repentant, just like it says here, when our heart is repentant and turned back to God, He can forgive. He can cleanse. He can restore. Well, as we see this, I hope and pray that you'll see some of the similarities in the church. <laughs> Why it's important for us to present ourselves not just as, as Christians by name, but Christians by our life. That is the problem here. You have no persecution today about Jesus Christ and Him as Savior. None. No persecution. There's nobody coming after you about that issue. Maybe on other issues, but not that one. No persecution. What do you do? You need to wake up. You need to be watchful. You need to remember the things that you've been taught, the things that Scripture says. You know, there may be some in here today who have never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And you may be saying, wait a minute, I want to be one of those that is able to, to be able to walk in white. Or I want to be one who follows Christ wherever He goes. I want to do those things because of who He is. This about the church didn't scare me. In fact, Pastor, I see these things about the church and it troubles me because I didn't know that the church was supposed to be making such a difference. And because now I know I'm going to follow Him because I'm going to show the world who He is. If you don't know Jesus Christ today, I've got to tell you, don't walk out of this place without accepting Him, without receiving Christian, I would say to you, it talks about repenting and doing what's right. In just a few moments, we're going to be partaking of the Lord's Supper. It says don't do that with the wrong spirit, with the wrong attitude. Don't take it unworthily. Don't take it just because it gets passed to you. Take it because it's something that we glorify God with in remembrance of what His Son did at Calvary. It was His life. Yeah. That's why we celebrate. Don't be thinking about, oh my goodness, the meal that I've got prepared might be a little overcooked. Don't be worried about getting the, to the restaurant more than the Methodist or quicker than the Methodist. Don't be worried about all of those things. You need to be focused on the priority of, hey, we're about to partake in something. That they would have said, hey, we do this, therefore look at us. But we need to take it not because we want to show anything to the world, but because we love Him. And we understand the price of and it ought to bring to us a remembrance of what He did in our lives as those who accepted Jesus Christ. I'm not scared by the letters to these churches. And I go, oh my goodness. I'm not scared by them. I'm troubled because I see churches and I see people of God. They don't know these things. They're living in a world of compromise. And now of all times, it's a time to lovingly, firmly tell them about Jesus Christ. Not to compromise, to cause our children to go down long roads, or our friends to go down long roads, but a time to be the best friend and the best parent we can be to them and show them what God's Word says. That's what they live in. And I would hope and pray that you would be willing to do that as Christians. Would you stand with me? Father, we